selecting the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising technology that's right for your organization, uh, which is just one session in this four-part series today under the name Peer-to-Peer -peer World Virtual Conference. It's brought to you by four companies that serve nonprofits and have come together to share their unique experience and knowledge with the sector. Arm Brewster Consulting Group, Cathexis Partners, Donor Voice, and Fracture. My name is David Hesekiel. I'm the president and founder of the Peer-to-Peer -peer Professional Forum in the US and Peer-to-Peer -peer Fundraising Canada. And I'm happy to be introducing each session in today's conference. Uh, if you're not familiar with Peer-to-Peer -peer Professional Forum, we cover this topic throughout the year uh, in many forums, newsletters, articles, studies, and then the highlight of our year is this coming November 1, we'll have a conference in Canada, at Peer to Peer Fundraising Canada, and then in March 1st and 2nd, we will be gathering in Atlanta for our 11th annual Peer to Peer Professional Forum Conference, and I hope you'll check that out. Uh, during this session, please feel free to submit questions in the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel, and uh, we'll forward them to the speakers uh, towards the end of the session. Do not fear, this session is being recorded and will be made available to you uh, online after the virtual conference is over. So with that, I turn it over to Mark Becker. Thanks, David, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and hope you've enjoyed the other sessions, uh, if you were able to attend. Uh, again, if not, uh, they are being recorded and will be available on um, www.itsapeertopeerworld.com um, uh, in the next few days here. Uh, what we're going to be talking about in this session is selecting the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising technology that's right for your organization. Um, I've got a great panel here that's going to be uh, helping me out with this topic of, of nonprofit professionals. You can tell, uh, looking at this, this great looking group, that I am the odd man out. Uh, I, you can also tell that um, that is what, look, that I, what I look like after 12 years of not working in an office, working from home. Um, that is me. Um, so um, that's why I like doing virtual conferences. Um, <laughs> But we're looking forward to having uh, this panel discussion and look forward to your questions as well, just because of you know technical um, ability to make sure that it's a nice experience for everybody. We want to keep everybody on mute, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. We want to make this an interactive session, so feel free as the questions come up to enter them into uh, the chat box available, uh, and we will get to those uh, along the way. Um, and definitely want to make sure we hear from everybody. Uh, I'll come back to the the panel here shortly uh, and we'll do introductions of, of all these great folks um, but before we do I wanted to go a bit into um, kind of the technology landscape uh, and talk about this paper we're, we're releasing this week um, and uh, that's kind of supporting this this topic uh, and then we'll, we'll have the panel discussion in the second half talking about um, folks that have, have been through this process at least one time, if not more in most cases, uh, and kind of lessons they've learned uh, from the trenches. So um, kind of why I thought it was a, a topic worth, worth discussing is because I've been doing this for uh, quite a number of years um, uh, officially um, as a nonprofit consulting professional since 2004. And I've just seen a lot of changes over the years and a lot of new offerings out there. Um, so I thought it was worth, you know, at, at this time to kind of step back and put together kind of where we are, what the options are for different peer-to-peer -peer platforms, um, and to help kind of back up where we've been in over the last 15 years as far as platforms go, I put together this slide to kind of take us on a, a, a brief uh, journey through recent past. Um, so back in 2004 is kind of where I'm starting the story with Kintera launching uh, Friends Asking Friends, or FAF. Um, Artez Interactive also launched uh, Event at the time. Um, not sure which you know which one came first. I'm not going to get into that discussion. Uh, I don't know the details of it, but basically, I'm I'm putting the starting point 15 years ago with those two, and then Convio launched Team Razor in 2002. So so far, still a pretty uh, select few options to choose from. Um, later on, uh, 2003, Mark Sutton founds uh, First Giving, 
And there's a specific reason why I'm putting that path on the, the right there because I think it tells a great story um, of how um, this, this industry kind of works in a, in a great way and, and how important the people are in the industry and how even though someone might leave a specific position or role, um, it all comes back full circle. Uh, and uh, I, I often go to conferences like NTC and, and feel like it's kind of a, a high school or college reunion and uh, or a case of musical chairs and everybody just is, is still there, but maybe just one booth over from where they were the year before. Um, but I kind of digress there. Um, moving into 2005, Neon CRM came along. Jeff Gordy, who used to be at a nonprofit himself, um, uh, wasn't seeing the, the tool that he wanted to do the job, so he created um, Neon CRM or Z2 Systems and, and Neon uh, Platform back in 2005. Um, 2006, Razu came out, um, and 2007, Crowdster, Raisin, Kimbia, Donor Drive. Uh, Donor Drive, I think, was actually around a little bit longer than that, um, um, but under this name, I think it was launched in 2007. Um, Everyday Hero uh, came out in Australia in 2007 as well, and um, Givzooks. Um, so, yeah, Givzooks, uh, 2007 was a busy year. That kind of sums it up. 2008, BlackBot acquired Kintera. And uh, in 2008, uh, Mark Sutton actually joined Artez Interactive. Um, 2009, we saw the, the birth of Fundly. Um, 2010, Fundraiser came out. And um, you know, I'm not sure if, how many of these different tools you've all have heard of, um, et cetera, but uh, definitely um, some of this, when I started researching this a few months ago, some of these were new names to me. Others were, oh yeah, I remember um, receiving some emails or I thought that was called something else. So um, hopefully this is all kind of bringing back some recent memories for folks. And then also in 2010, you know, just because, why not have uh, a, a celebrity uh, go ahead and launch a, a platform as well, as well? So Edward Norton thought that uh, he wasn't seeing what he wanted to see, so he started Crowd, CrowdRise. Um, in 2011, BlackBot acquired Everyday Hero. Um, Classy came out, originally as Stay Classy. Uh, Rallybound, uh, I Donate, Causevox. Uh, 2012, BlackBot acquired Convio. So I'm still seeing some different players moving around there. Uh, and with Convio, uh, uh, you know, the Team Razor product came along with that. Also in 2012, uh, Frontstream acquires First Giving. Um, and in 2012, Charity Engine came out with their peer-to-peer -peer solution, QGive, uh, with, with I, what I believe was first called Hobnob um, for their peer-to-peer -peer solution. Um, then in 2013, Frontstream acquired Artez. And this, to me, uh, just kind of circle completes the full circle, bringing Mark Sutton back to um, the company uh, or the platform that he originally founded because First Giving was now also at Frontstream. So I thought it was just a, a great little picture to show one person's journey um, in uh, the nonprofit peer-to-peer -peer fundraising space. And I think, you know, Mark's a great guy, smart guy, and I think a great example of how there's really smart um, people moving uh, while they're not always staying with the same companies. Um, well, luckily, we haven't lost them from the nonprofit fund fundraising space. Also in 2013, Give Effect came out, Flip Cause, um, Click and Pledge Connect. 2014 brought us, um, uh, actually Salesforce acquired G uh, Gizooks. Uh, not Salesforce, sorry, Salsa acquired Gizooks. And then 2015, Nonprofit Easy actually acquired Fundly, but I thought did something interesting and actually kept the Fundly name uh, for the entire Nonprofit Easy suite of, of tools. Um, Great feats came out, um, uh, really from a bunch of uh, a few of the um, ex uh, Convio folks um, have started great feats. Engaging networks also came out in 2015, and generosity by Indiegogo came out last year as well. And this year, Giving Spirit officially, I think, Mark started marketing this year, but I think they've been around for a few years prior to that. So. In that short span of 15 years, we've seen um, 27, and this, this isn't all of them, um, this is 27 different peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platforms that have, have kind of come out and been rearranged and, and changed and updated uh, in a very short amount of time. So 
why I go through all that. First of all, I find it really interesting. Um, and so thank you for letting me um, get work that out of my system. Um, <laughs> and secondly, uh, it leads into me realizing a few months ago that I, you know, I hadn't seen a, a kind of complete guide of different peer-to-peer -peer fundraising tools. There's been a, a few different articles and, and some um, brief resources here and there. So I, I wanted to take a shot at putting the one together. Um, after spending a few months on it, I understand why it hasn't been done before because I think my hair is grayer and falling out and and uh, it's been quite a, a challenge over the last few months but um, had a lot of great conversations with different vendors and with different um, organizations using the different tools and the result of that is this guide that we're making available um, later this week um, that is a free guide to peer-to-peer -to -peer, uh, technology uh, tools. So um, wanted to, because it is so vast uh, an environment and you know this does include 27 different um, uh, platforms in this guide, um, there's a lot of different details and different things to consider based on the type of campaigns that you're running. And I've, spoke, I've spoken with folks like, like David himself actually about you know what even are the different types of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns. Um, so in the, in the book that we go through that briefly and talk about um, the different tools and the different functionality you might need just based on the different types of campaigns that you're supporting. Maybe it's a, um, a, a a f actual physical event like a 5k or a three-day walk or or an overnight um, or a bike ride that type of thing um, so then it read it, things like registration um, potentially um, collecting additional information like t-shirt size or connection to the cause um, is all important to you um, maybe um, you're doing a, a challenge endurance or a destination event um, like something like the Walt Disney World um, marathons, uh, run any of the Run Disney marathons, where they give out a certain number of of um, slots to nonprofits to be able to um, have folks fundraise a minimum for, um, so that they can attend those events and get one of those hard to to get spots. Um, and and with that comes its own need for things like maybe a credit card guarantee for to ensure that people raise the minimum funds required to, to meet their needs um, or more advanced uh, fundraising kits to help people get to their fundraising goals. Um, then there's virtual campaigns which quite often don't have a registration fee uh, and really focus more on allowing people to set up their pages and fundraise um, however they want to for the cause. Then it comes down to really um, a focus on engagement and making sure it's easy for people to share their pages, um, share the word, and make it viral. Very similar are independent uh, fundraisers and quite often interchanged where people can have a bake sale or host um, their own little 5K in their event uh, in their area. It might not even be that little. Um, or what, however they might, you know, maybe it's a ice cream social, whatever it might be, uh, workplace giving, um, actual physical events that, that your supporters, your constituents are actually um, putting on. So then maybe tools like being able to do a zip code lookup um, might become in, important. Then of course there's tribute and moral campaigns uh, where it's really all about um, not a registration flow but being able to um, share information about um, someone you love um, or um, a cause that's important to you and, and really being able to again spread that world, word in more of a, a viral nature. So then in the guide we, we talk a lot about and what you need to consider when selecting a tool is um, different areas like design um, and you know is it going to be a white labeled um, uh, micro campaign where it's totally controlled by you the nonprofit or uh, at the other end of the scale um, is the vendor's uh, logo kind of highlighted front and center and your organizational logo is still there but a lower you know lower point on the um, on the page um, and less less dominant and, and harder to see also things to consider are white label versus vendor domains um, in other words does it have um, you know the vendors um, domain in the actual URL versus your own organizational domain 
and then how much can you control as the customer, as the organization, the layout, the design of the actual um, environment. Most tools, all to tools actually, to some degree, allow you to do some click and, and configure, maybe some drag and drop, that type of thing. Um, but if you care to, and if you need to, for branding reasons, get in and really um, do custom coding, uh, what tools you allow you to do that, or which ones um, can also allow you to do that, or have you um, have a uh, work with one of their partners or the vendor themselves to customize that if you don't care to do that yourselves. When thinking about engagement, it's looking at things like, um, you know, participant emails. Are is there their ability for them to be able to send out? Um, uh, emails to their contacts uh, once they register, either using the native email tool in the system or their own local email tool. Um, and is there also the ability for the organization to provide sample emails so that they can, uh, the participants can basically use that as a starting point uh, to send out communications to their contacts. Also, is there a built-in uh, tool for overall email communications beyond just the autoresponders and the receiving that's built into every tool to some degree? Can you send out, as an organization, uh, email announcements letting the, the, uh, your constituents know that its, it's uh, registration is open or the campaign has started uh, and spread the word? And can you also you know, set up and schedule and send out um, coaching emails or fundraising emails? Um, post-event um, uh, follow-ups and surveys and, and that type of thing. Uh, social media uh, integration comes with pretty much, to some level, almost every tool these days. Some way or another, you can either, um, social media either is baked right into these different tools or um, you can drop in and embed different social media widgets that are available from Twitter and Facebook, et cetera. Um, but kind of taking that to the next level, uh, is it there also the ability to have social uh, media single sign-on during registration or sign-up uh, for the campaign so that folks can use their Facebook or Google Plus or whatever credentials um, and actually simplify or streamline the registration flow a bit? Um, maybe that's important to your campaigns, maybe it's not, um, but these are all some things we looked at and can, you know, want to make sure that you consider when you're reviewing different options, because um, I'll probably say it more than once and I'm surprised I've gotten um, this far into it, 15, 20 minutes into this without saying it yet. You know, when you talk to these different vendors, more than likely they're going to tell you they're the best, um, and that's fine. Um, but are they the best for your campaign or campaigns and what you need them to do? Um, so make sure you have a clear understanding of what you're looking to accomplish and what features are important to you. Um, for example, the ability to form teams. A lot of the tools, most of the tools these days, do have that functionality. Um, we, there are all kinds of reports out that show that um, allowing people to form teams and join teams, um, they usually uh, fundraise substantially more than individual uh, participants. Then within the user interface um, uh, areas, uh, can it take event registration? Um, can it charge a fee to register? Can it ask additional questions? Ability to rejoin a campaign from one year to the next, you know, and, and what that means is being able to uh, take advantage of bringing in their contacts automatically and looking at who donated to them um, if they if they are, are your longtime constituents and longtime participants and, and are, are your super supporters. Um, it'll help simplify their year-over-year -year support of your campaigns is gamification built into it, and that can mean a lot of things, and I'm using a little air quotes right now that you can't see, but um, it could mean in the case of something like Everyday Hero, gamification is built in by, uh, in my mind, uh, gamification is built in by allowing the uh, uh, participants to um, sync up with Map My Run and other tools so that their, their workouts and their training runs uh, or rides or walks can be uh, updated right into their personal pages um, so that their supporters and friends can see their their training progress towards um, physical events um, or it might be a fundraising badge um, based on someone um, reaching their their milestone of the first five hundred dollars or the first thousand dollars or it might indicate that they gave a self donation or it might indicate that they um, had uh, a team with X number of members so those little badges can really help again get people um, the 
gratification and the acknowledgement that they 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 all crave this day and age. Um, can you allow multi-registration in, in one transaction? That might be a, a very important um, requirement in your specific campaign. So make sure you, again, have these list of requirements. Uh, can you do a credit card guarantee? In other words, like um, when you reserve a car, uh, it's the same type of thing. Um, if there's a fundraising minimum, uh, say $2,500 at time of registration, you pay $100, you guarantee later on, or uh, maybe a couple months before the event, you guarantee to meet the fundraising minimum um, or you won't be able to participate. And one way to do that is either raise all the funds before the event and or give your credit card guarantee to say you'll raise it by X date, usually so many days or months after the event, uh, and that gives you more time to continue fundraising. And, and whatever is left to be raised by the time that it gets charged would just go against your credit card. Um, is there ability to do offline gift recording? That type of thing. Um, on the administrative side, can you create custom reports? Um, can you uh, have event coordinator access, minim minimum security access, so they can just, uh, if you have support staff out in the field uh, that are just supporting one of your campaigns, um, uh, or volunteer or remote staff, can you limit their access just to that event without having complete access to your entire system? Um, what currencies are supported? Uh, and that doesn't mean what currency can be accepted, uh, it's what currency can that be reported in. Um, U.S. Canadian Euro, um, what have you. Can you, uh, for example, support Canadian tax receding? Uh, if you're a Canadian event, there's very specific tax laws uh, in the tax code, and does the system support that? Another areas that are important are integration with uh, Razor's Edge, um, Salesforce.org, or is it a part of an enterprise system itself? What merchant services does it support? And maybe your your organization. We've worked with some banks before, or some foundations that are associated with banks. Obviously, they prefer to use their own merchant services. You know, is that an option? Um, does the system offer APIs, or does it integrate with other things like HEP data for for matching gifts, uh, that type of thing, or Wealth Engine, or other type of wealth uh, mining uh, tools? Um, so we try to look at all these different things. And of course, um, last but not least, uh, what does it cost for these things? What is the implementation costs, uh, if any? Uh, what are the month monthly or annual fees? What are their transaction fees on top of credit card fees? And what are the contract terms? Um, you know, it kind of runs the gamut when we did this, when I looked into this. Um, some are just monthly. You can cancel it at any time. Others are three years contracts and, and everything in between. So make sure that you know what you're, you know, committing to. And quite often, even based on what's in, in our, our guide, those things are negotiable, but they have a starting point um, and uh, are, are all put together in that guide to really help get you on the uh, right path to at least start to narrow down all those choices to the ones that really are right for your organization. All right, so enough of me um, speaking. I want to hear, and I'm sure you all want to hear from this great panel, and now with my picture missing, it's a much better looking uh, slide. Um, so I'm gonna give everybody a, a chance to uh, introduce themselves, and then I'm gonna ask a series of questions. Um, so if Kathy, if you would like to kick it off. Okay, my name is Kathy Cabry, and I've been working in the peer-to-peer -peer space for 11 years now. And I got into the fundraising like a lot of you did. You, you believed in the cause and wanted to do more. And here's how it happened for me. I wanted to run the 20, 2004 Marine Corps Marathon while my husband was deployed to Iraq. And when I tried to register for the race, it was sold out. And the only way to secure a slot was to join a charity partner team. None of the charity partner missions really spoke to me, and their fundraising minnows were huge, so I ended up running a local race. I'd always been a supporter of Fisher House Foundation, especially since so many military families had benefited by their services during OIF. I thought to myself, why doesn't Fisher House host a team so other military spouses like me can take part in the great race and support the military community at the same time? When I approached Fisher House in 2005 with the idea, they were thrilled and surprisingly asked me to take the lead. Uh, the small team of 85 runners Fisher House hosted in 2006 to 550 in 2015, with the total funds raised at all the military races topping $5 million. I have worked with Fisher House as a volunteer, a contractor, an on-site employee, and now as a consultant. And I truly believe in taking action when you want to show your support of an organization. Actions always speak louder than words. 
and there is no more loyal supporter than a fundraiser. And I think that nonprofits should do everything possible to make raising funds and awareness for their organization easy, fun, and meaningful. And that's it. Great, thank you. Jessica. Yeah, hi everyone. So my name is Jessica Dean, and I've been working in the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising space for about six years. Um, so similarly, my first experience with it was uh, my friend roped me into training and fundraising for the Nike Women's San Francisco Marathon uh, back in 2006 for team and training. And I ended up really loving my experience, so it turned into a full-on professional career for me. Um, I started out in the space at Stand Up to Cancer, and I was initially working on things there, like their celebrity-driven telethon um, and cause marketing campaigns with companies like Major League Baseball MasterCard. Uh, but while I was there, we identified that they were in need of more grassroots support. So I helped to develop a grassroots toolkit and launched a DIY program called Team Stand Up. Uh, at that time, we had started out getting 10 slots in the New York Marathon and opening it up so people were able to sign up and do any race they wanted nationwide. And it then grew into um, having things, you know, like big cross fit competitions across the country. Um, after that, I went to the Crohn's and Clitus Foundation of America, and I oversaw the Greater LAOC Region of Team Challenge, which is their half marathon and triathlon training program. And after, from there, I launched a national indoor cycling program called Spin for Crohn's and Clitus Cures, which this year is now in 18 markets. And I started at the Sierra Club this past May to launch a new DIY program, which is called Team Sierra. So since it is launching in a few weeks, um, picking a platform is very fresh on my mind. And over the years, I've worked with various platforms like Team Razor, Active, CrowdRise, uh, RallyBound, uh, both you know on the admin side and as a fundraiser myself. That's awesome. You've been pretty busy. <laughs> How about you, Mary? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm honored to serve the 28,000 kids out there who are fighting the deadliest form of childhood cancer. I've been helping them out for about also about 11 years, um, and about the past eight of those peer-to-peer um, -peer fundraising. And I came to the PBTF from a career in corporate communications um, for a very personal reason, because I had lost a family member to this disease. And when I got here 11 years ago, we had nothing. We were still taking pieces of paper and, and, and not even taking credit cards at our events. So there was a gradual shift um, to convince our founders that it was a good idea to let people um, give by credit card, but we still didn't have a way for people to ask for donations online. So initially we were first giving clients back when it was just giving. In 2006 we were get active clients for our website and our um, online donation forms and so forth, but there was um, a long gap there before we became Team Razor clients in 2012. And that was an interesting experience for us. Um, we we're on Razor's Edge and have been since 98. Um, we have um, experienced bumps along the way trying to get Razor's Edge to talk to Luminate. Um, which we may go into more detail later. But we have two major fundraising programs that um, use the Team Razor platform, Ride for Kids and Starry Night, which is a walk run. Very different audiences with very different needs. And we are in the process of investigating other options that might serve our audiences better. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Mary. And definitely, last but not least, Tim. Thanks, Mark. Um, my name is Tim Newman and I work at uh, Heifer International. I've been in the nonprofit space for around 18 years, um, 15 of those at Heifer. Um, I have a little bit different background than the panel, so I'm sort of the newbie to the peer-to-peer -peer space. I've only been working in peer-to-peer -peer for about five years. Um, but got into the space because um, at Heifer once we decided to um, ramp up a peer-to-peer -peer program, um, we were looking at um, the opportunities that were out there. and before I started working in peer-to-peer, -peer, I worked uh, on the education side um, at the nonprofit. And what I did was I worked with um, a program called Read to Feed, which is a school-based program that basically asks kids to read books and then ask their friends and family to raise money um, uh, in support of their reading. And then kids basically take the money that they earn. 
tunnel. Um, so essentially that's peer-to-peer. -peer. So um, because I was the only one who had any experience in this in this arena, they asked me to, to help launch a peer-to-peer -peer program at the organization. Um, so like I said, I've been working on that for about five years and um, excited to be here. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. All right. That is the um, the panel. So wanted to get to the first section. I think we touched on this briefly in some ways, but more specifically, wanted to dig back into this and and uh, ask each of you, kind of again, you know, more specifics about when did the nonprofit first implement and start using peer to peer platform, and what made your organization desire it decided that you need one. And I know, Tim, you kind of just spoke to that a little bit, but if you could uh, talk a little bit about it, the, the few years you've been, been working in that space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, Heifer did host a peer-to-peer -peer program since around 2010 on the Friends Asking Friends platform, but we didn't maintain it or support it or market it or promote it at all. <laughs> so it was just something that was there, and if you were good enough investigator to to go on the website and find it then you know you could fundraise and some people actually did do that but in 2012 the organization started looking at revenue diversification ideas and um, Heifer as you may or may not know is a heavy direct marketing nonprofit um, we get roughly 60 million dollars annually catalog program so as we began doing landscape analysis on new revenue channels uh, peer to peer kept popping up to the top um, and even though we had a program that wasn't supported or promoted, it was dripping in small amounts of revenue. So we felt it was an easy transition and we had some existing interests that we could leverage. So deciding on the platform was, was the next big step, really, and um, we decided since we had used the platform with some success, we could find something we could customize and create a good experience around rather than going third party or white labeling something else. Got it. And Mary, you had mentioned that you all have been on um, uh, Team Razor, I believe, since since 2012, and and mm -hmm. there's there's uh, people considering, or I'm not sure if it's officially or unofficially considering a, a potential move. And and uh, one of the reasons why we were speaking recently, I thought it'd be great to have you on this panel because it is such a a good timing for you. Anything else to add around that? Sure. Um, you know, as we've grown. Um, Team Racer doesn't do everything we need it to do. It's great for some of what we do, but not all of what we do. And um, particularly on the donor development side, they are just clamoring for a tool that is looks better, isn't as clunky, um, is simpler for people to use, something we can... Literally, I had a conversation with someone last week um, in Orlando who said, you know, I just want to be able to tap my phone and buy a ticket for this drawing that you're doing. I don't want to enter my information. I don't, I don't have time for that. I want to tap my phone and just give you the money. And we aren't set up to do that. And we want to be able to reach a younger audience, too. It's been a real challenge for us to even get our older demographic aboard on Team Razor. And, you know, but they're not the only people we're talking to. We, we need to be more to more people. So we are actively looking for a tool that can do more for us. And then, thank you. And then, Jessica, I know you've recently joined Sierra Club, but they've been going through a process even before you joined into looking to select a different uh, tool um, or a tool for this campaign. Um, any, any more background that you can share with that? Yeah, so they started the process um, of looking at different platforms last spring, um, and it started with a, a couple of my coworkers actually went to the peer-to-peer -peer, um, professional forum conference, which I believe was in February. Um, we just started building the platform in August uh, after we officially chose it, and um, it will be, like, like I said, launching in a few weeks. So we just entered into beta, beta testing a couple weeks ago, um, and our plan is to now receive feedback from people who will be testing the system and work out all of those kinks so it's implemented before we launch publicly. Great, great. And then Kathy, with, with um, Team Fisher House, you all have, have kind of um, been on Team Razor for a bit, and then you went to try out another tool to, to I think, bring uh, all your different aspects um, into one platform um, and then realize that maybe um, uh, a point solution uh, just using team uh, team razor specifically for peer to peer um, might be uh, more appropriate so you're looking at kind of relaunching with that is that anything else to add to that 
Yeah, well, when we first started, we chose a platform that really was cheap and easy. You know, no upfront fees, charge a percentage of online transactions, and it was a great way to start a program. But then after a couple of years, we needed something more robust, more automatic, and that's when we went to Team Razor in 2013, and we were there for three years. But realizing after going and trying something new that it really wasn't meeting the needs of our fundraisers, you know, nor meeting the needs of us as administrators. So we're going back, mm -hmm. and we we really appreciate it. <laughs> good, good. And I know it sounds like you initially started out kind of as a as a team of one to to go down this road, but um, uh, it's grown. Who all was involved, and and what's that look like when it comes to deciding, you know, what tool you're going to use, kind of year over year, or, or how often? What does that process look like, either officially or unofficially, to to kind of review what tool you're going to be on? Well, in 2006, you know, they hired a volunteer who lived in Kansas to, to run the whole show. So I chose the platform initially then, but they weren't ready to invest in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising at that time, nor did was it really out there, you know, used by a lot of different organizations. But when we just, that platform got bought out, we were on active giving for three years. And then when we decided that we needed something more robust, um, I basically went through the the review process kind of figured out what we were what we were looking for, what our requirements were, et cetera, and presented three potential providers who met those needs to my boss who made the final decision. But this was when we made that move, it had a significant upfront investment and a three year contract. So I did all the groundwork for that decision to be made, but wasn't in a position to sign the contract at that point. Got it. Got it. And then Jessica, you're you're kind of coming in late in the last few months in in the um, process. But um, prior to your arrival, uh, it sounds like there was plenty of people involved. Who else was involved at Sierra Club in in kind of the the review process? Yeah. So we have a pretty large organization. So we had um, several people who were involved from different departments, and um, I was I was involved in the final decision. So. Um, it started out, the, the different departments were our IT team. Um, so our long-term goal was to integrate our platform with the greater Sierra Club database, and we wanted to make sure that we were, you know, be, going to be able to move the data smoothly from one system to another. Um, we also had our web development team weigh in. Um, you know, there, there's custom web development that we've been doing on the site, so we wanted them to take a look and make sure they would be able to integrate that. Um, we do a lot with email automation, so we have that team weigh in to look at our platform uh, automation system. Um, I'm within the online fundraising department, um, and so that department, my department, was the one that made the final de decision. Um, we also worked with our digital product team. Um, since we have at the Sierra Club a lot of different digital assets and web spaces, we wanted to make sure from a user stand standpoint the platform worked with uh, the Sierra Club's various assets and um, fit into our brand and was consistent with the user experience um, we provide. And then we also had uh, one of our data and an analysts look at it to ensure that we were able to pull the t right type of reporting um, within Rallybound that would be complementary to our current reporting system. Got it. Sounds like a, a, a full full core press and uh, that's great because you do have to look at it so, from so many different angles. Um, Mary, how about how about your organization, um, PDAC Brain Tumor Foundation, how, who was all involved originally and, and kind of now that you're kind of mid-process or considering, are you officially in the, the process at this point yes. of looking again? Yeah. Yes, we are. And, and one thing I actually didn't say about that, I should have said, is that part of that change is being driven by um, acquiring an organization that is using another platform and trying to decide if we're going to convert to what they use or or do something completely different. So that's a, another wrinkle to it. Um, originally when we went we were with Just Giving, that was driven honestly by demand from our fundraisers who said, hey, you guys, you ought to be doing this. And um, Within the first year, it was absolutely clear that it was to our benefit to do it. We were we you know, exceeded all of our expectations with fundraising, um, but it was gradual um, for our founders, for our culture, to move to I think trusting online donations. We are very 
our Ride for Kids program in particular is a very, very much a face-to-face -face relationship building. You know, let me tell you about these kids, let mm -hmm. me get a check from you, that kind of thing. So that has been an evolution for us. So early on that was driven, as I said, by fundraisers, few folks who just support our cause. Um, early on it was championed by me. Um, at the time I was the only person here doing any marketing and communications. Um, but it was also the decision had to be made by our campaign team. And at the time our only campaign was Ride for Kids. Um, so it was pretty simple. When we made the move to Team Racer, that was a lot more effort and thought um, involved. Or certainly our CFO um, had a big role in it, our development team, um, our campaigns um, were growing. Um, so we had Team Razor for Ride for Kids first, and then when we started the Walk Run, um, we kind of we took what we had and tried to make it fit the Walk Run. And they're so different. We, we're we're you know, we're three years in now, and seeing some of the pain there. And I will say we depend very heavily on our vendor um, for customization to help us work with workarounds. Um, we're now we only have two folks working on it, one full time on the website, the email marketing. Um, but it's heavy duty, and we would like to be in a place where there was more automation and more customization, um, and something that could serve many needs. But yes, we are actively looking and um, haven't landed on on a partner yet. And the the organization that is merging with you are do they have their own? Mm -hmm series of campaigns or unique ones or just kind of similar or same? Theirs is different. Um, it's not an event. It is um, a, a model where they work with teams, sports teams, um, from Little League all the way up to the NFL um, to raise money um, for their cause and, you know, all childhood camps. They're not just brain tumors. So um, it's very much peer to peer, but you know their constituents. Many of them are college students who just send a text with a link out to their friends saying, "Give to my page." Um, there is no um, ongoing physical contact with um, you know a, an actual event where people come out and I'll get a T-shirt for the cause or anything like that. And a lot more virtual than our our traditional events that we you do. Sound, you sound a little jealous. Uh, having been in the trenches <laughs> myself, uh, <laughs> I know how it is putting out those porta potties and all that. So, um, sure, yeah, those so virtual I mean, campaigns are great. <laughs> yeah, so, it, it, and you know, it's, it's a different animal for us, so we're learning as we go to. Great, great. And then, um, Tim, uh, you all have been on, I think it's classy for a few years now, right? Um, uh, but uh, what was the team involved in that process? Um, and, you know, is there um, a current uh, considerations for, you know, uh, moving forward that you can speak to or anything like that? Right. Yeah, so like Jessica uh, in Sierra Club, uh, Heifer International is a pretty large organization. And so as we were looking at moving into the peer-to-peer -peer space and really thinking about the diversification of our revenue, um, there's a lot of consideration around budget and you know rerouting budget towards this new initiative. So we had to get support from our C-level leadership um, and approach it sort of as a phased program. Um, so since we did make it past our, our first couple of phases, we were able to come back and say, hey, this program was successful and now we're um, actually talking with our board about a larger investment um, in order to grow the program and add an endurance component and things like that. But but initially we did have to have support from our state level leadership, uh, but we also included um, many other members of our you know marketing, fundraising, resource development team. Um, so our initial selection group was um, our marketing VP. We had people from our IT and CRM staff. We had our web team and designers. You know, there as well as our you know our newly formed peer-to-peer -peer team. So we took a really good look at you know all sort of all phases of the program and what we would need to support it um, when we were making our decision. Awesome. So you know, I think a pretty good cross section here of um, different panelists from you know larger organizations to to smaller to mid-sized organizations um, to give you an idea of you know regardless, um, someone has to select uh, the tool, and it might be several someone's, and and but a lot of the hopefully the the process um, 
might still be different variations of the same thing. Research, you know, uh, maybe a uh, official RFP process, maybe not. Doing demos, uh, negotiating contracts, uh, it can definitely um, be uh, a, a lot to it. And I think we've heard some about the processes, but um, any anything else to add, uh, Tim, to what you just said um, about the actual selection process? Right. Well, we did have some help as well. I, I didn't mention that we hired, you know, we hired a pre-to-pre -pre consultant um, that really helped us with our discovery process and so and some of our research around the different platforms that we might um, be interested in. Um, and so we did identify a couple and and sent out RFPs and asked for demos, just like you said, Mark. And our initial group was Artez and Team Razor, and we ultimately selected Team Razor mainly because we use a BlackBot Enterprise CRM, um, and and we loved how the back end pieces of Team Razor would integrate with our CRM and, and would allow us to have a seamless or almost seamless integration, as well as easy automated triggers, you know, for communications back and forth to the fundraisers and the donors. Um, but once we started the process, we realized that what we had conceptualized was <laughs> Uh, very customized user experience and interface that created like certain experience for the fundraisers. And as we went through the process with Blackbot, even though the backend components integrated nicely and allowed for that seamless stewardship experience, we didn't like the front end user experience. Um, so we sort of started down a road of customizations that we soon realized would be way more expensive than we expected and would take a lot longer than our plan had allowed. Um, so we started looking at other solutions and kept coming back to Classy which we hadn't originally selected as part of our initial process, but we loved how beautiful the front end was and how easy it was to use. And so we scheduled a demo and quickly realized that their team was, was really open and flexible and available and was willing to do more to give us a platform that would fit our needs. Um, uh, so they don't have the back end integration and flexibility of Razor, obviously, but we ultimately compromised on that in order to have the front end that we crave. Uh, so essentially our decision making conversation came down to if we don't get fundraisers to use the platform, there, there won't be anybody to steward at the end. <laughs> so, right. so we decided to, to uh, go with Classy and we've been very happy with the decision. Good stuff. And um, Mary, anything to add about process uh, that you all are going through currently or um, have in the past? Well, you know, one of the challenges with thinking about moving to the other platform and the one that the other organization is using is Classy is that the beauty, if I can call it that, of everything, having everything in the Luminate wheelhouse is that it's all in one place and we deal with one vendor, one support person. Um, you know, it, there have been bumps between Razor's Edge and Luminate, so two different people there. but. You know, it's kind of nice that we know who to call. We have, you know, a single source. Um, with Classy, we'll have to look at other options. We we would use everything in the Luminate, um, mod, every module they have except advocacy. And if we moved to Classy for the event fundraising, it can't do everything that we do now in one place, and we would have to manage different relationships. And that would take time, and so we're looking at that in the cost benefit analysis. You know, what will that cost in staff time? What will that cost in extra vendor time to help us manage in five different places instead of one? Yep, great questions to ask up front for sure. Um, how about yourself, Jessica? Anything else on the, the selection process that you haven't covered already? Um, uh, well, we personally, we, we started out just with um, existing relationships that our senior director of digital engagement had. Um, and when, when we started that way, we did a pre-demo with all the different uh, contenders and we followed that up with a pretty comprehensive questionnaire um, that we asked all of the different platforms to fill out and return. Um, within that questionnaire, we have lots of different questions that are the different departments I mentioned before um, contributed to so that we made sure that we were getting all of our different questions answered in one place. And then that helped us to narrow it down um, to two final contenders where we did a very lengthy demo um, with the different departments included. So again, we could get all of those questions answered. Uh, so who we who we ended up picking and are using is Rallybound. Got it. Great, great. 
Um, and you're launching, you said, soon? Yep, in a few weeks. Nice. Well, good luck. Um, Thank you. Kath, <laughs> Kathy, um, anything uh, to, more to talk about regarding kind of your move from Team Razor to Charity Engine and back to Team Razor or anything else uh, in between or, or since? Well, I think the important move we made was off a very basic system to more comprehensive system. So I'll talk about the decisions we looked at when we moved to Team Razor. And we really wrote out really a huge a, a list of goals and requirements. So uh, we wanted you know, to enable our fundraisers to raise more money without having to hire more staff, grow the fundraising teams at each event without sacrificing fundraiser support, communicate with fundraisers regularly, personally, and actually accurately, and then make the fundraising process easy, fun, and meaningful. As far as requirements go, we were looking for the greatest level of automation. We were looking for reports that integrated registration and fundraising data in one source. We were looking for automated automated post-registration communication, customizable communication along the fundraising you know, season, and a, fi and a private fundraising portal where only fundraisers could manage their page, access our customized fundraising toolkit, and find updated event information. It's really important that we wrote the donation page text content, photos and videos, and wrote the email ask messages for the fundraisers. And we really needed a way for the fundraisers to guarantee their commitment with a credit card. But basically, overall, if I were to make a recommendation to somebody looking to move, make sure that your, your list of requirements are included in the, in the platform's out-of-the-box system and, and not a customized solution created with code. You know, making things beautiful with code is great, but creating function with code doesn't usually work very well. So great. we did the research, yeah. we, we did the demos, and we negotiated basically playing one off each other and they beat by price. So I know we're running out of time. <laughs> no, no, great, great stuff. And, and I think that brings us to a really important point uh, uh, in this whole discussion is kind of what, what part of your process worked the best and what could you have done differently? I think you touched on that uh, uh, you know, pretty well already, but anything else to add and also any last kind of word of advice? Um, well, the, creating that decision matrix based on your list of requirements and goals is really, really important. And so you don't get, you want to make sure it's, it's based on what their system gives and not, you know, when they do demos, they might show you the, the, the most coded out platform out there that looks beautiful and functions beautifully. But if that's not part of the original system, you really can't put that on, on your matrix. Making the move from active giving to, to Team Razor, I wouldn't have changed anything. Making other moves, but not, not such a great experience. But really, for, as far as words of advice goes, you know, ask yourself what you're trying to achieve with your fundraising program and how much staff support you have to manage it. And know that a robust platform will require a lot of time for initial setup and a higher upfront cost, but allows you more customization and autom automation for your organization, your fundraisers, and your donors. A simple platform might be a great way to test the waters with peer-to-peer -peer fund fundraising without a large upfront investment, but might require more staff time to get the data you need to manage the program and to communicate with fundraisers and donors effectively. So there are pros and cons to them all. You just have to see what your organization needs and maybe what your needs are three to five years from now as well. Well said. Well said. And then Jessica, I know you're kind of really in the heart of it right now. So again, thank you for all, you know, all of you for taking your time, but especially you, Jessica. Um, I'm sure you're <laughs> very much in the weeds of this right now. But um, you know, as far as the process goes, either during this process that you were involved in, or in the past with with Crohn's and Colitis or other organizations, you know, what's what have you seen worked well in selecting a tool, and what would you have done differently? And any words of, of advice? Yeah, so I, I agree with a lot of what Mary just said. Um, and what was really helpful for us was having that questionnaire that I mentioned. Um, that really gives you an opportunity to, to think about what it is that you and your organization are looking for in a platform and then get those answers written down on paper um, of, within each category, you know, from IT to user experience to email automation, what they can do. A lot of the platforms have a lot of different features that they offer, and it's really hard to keep track of them when you're looking at five to, you know, ten different platforms. Um, and so this gives a really good reference place to go back and say, like, hey, which did this platform offer, you know, 
uh, social media auto posting or did they offer you know different conditions that I can use when I'm sending out my emails um, to my registrants and uh, I just I just found that to be really really helpful um, the what and in terms of what I would have done differently um, this may this might be very specific to my organization but we since we are a long uh, a large organization we have a longer um, approval process so I would say you know know and understand your organization's approval process and when you're coming up with a date of when you want to launch that platform kind of work backwards and see exactly what what process needs it needs to go through for approval and how long that's going to take to get to that date. Um, so I would have I would have started the process a little bit earlier in hindsight. Great, yeah, great advice. Um, checklist and start early. I like it. Um, <laughs> I know I boiled that down way too simply, but yeah, great stuff. Mary, uh, any lessons learned? Um, what worked? What didn't? Any words of advice? I would not advise anyone to try to launch Team Razor for the first time for 37 events in um, three and a half months, which is what we did. <laughs> <laughs> that was crazy, and we definitely paid for those mis the mistakes that we made. We didn't know what we didn't know, but we had a mandate um, from new leadership to do that, and it, we absolutely did the right thing. But in retrospect, um, the mistakes we made are informing the process now. Um, we needed more beta testing, um, and we'll, we will be doing that. Um, we needed to get more users involved. Um, what we ended up with the first time around was a tool that looked a lot like our paper registration, and it, it was not what we needed at all. Um, so we, we spent about a year tweaking that, and we've continued to change along the way. And um, having more people involved, as painful as that can be, will help us um, have a better product um, in the end. Yeah, it's all about planning, uh, mm -hmm. proper amount of runway. I like it. Tim, any sage advice? <laughs> well, yeah, I, would, I would agree with a lot of what Kathy was saying, that if you can create a, a list of requirements and set priorities on you know, what are most important to your organization, um, that would be very helpful in the selection process. Um, because there's a lot of competing you know, priorities, but if you can focus in on, you know, what do you want to achieve with your program and how will the platform help you get there, um, you know, it might make it a little easier. Great. Great. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. I know we've been um, talking for quite a while um, and we're just kind of out of time here, but we had the luxury of being the last one, so it's okay if we run over a minute or two um, and happy to answer any audience questions. Uh, great. Well, uh, this has been a terrific uh, session, guys. Um, we have a few questions. James asks, if you've moved away from Team Razor, how do you now get your event data in uh, Razor's Edge? Was that for anybody in specifically? I'm trying to. Uh, uh, you are the master of ceremonies, Mark. You get to make the big decisions. You, there's a, a, a variety of ways. Um, tools like Omatic, Fracture, um, those uh, are the first to come to mind. Manual imports, exports, you know, there's an initial uh, import and then ongoing um, to think about. So it's, um, definitely something that's that's a whole ooh, that's a whole webinar in and of itself. But I'd, I'd love to chat with you about different options there for sure. So, uh, you know what, I, I actually would suggest, because of the hour of where we're at, um, Mark, I think that um, our team can send, there are three additional questions, but each of them is sort of a personal consulting question. Would you be willing Perfect. to uh, correspond with them after the effect? Happy to do so. Yep. Thank you, David. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to all of you who tuned in today for all or a part of our peer-to-peer uh, -peer world virtual conference. Uh, we hope to, uh, to be working with you and hearing great things about your progress with peer-to-peer -peer fundraising in the last waning months of 2016 and into 2017. Thanks for the opportunity to have been the moderator and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, panelists. Have a great Thanks. day. You too. Bye.